Okay, so I'm reading, and as you guys know, I'm preaching series. We're not in a series right now. We are reading the Bible together as a church chronologically. We're using the Bible recap reading plan. And so if you are, uh, if you are still on this Bible reading plan, go ahead and just wave your hand, shake it just like if you're still with us. Okay, we, we are now in the book of Joshua. So we've read, we're book of Judges now. We're in Judges. I'm a couple of days behind, but we're in Judges. But we just read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now we're in uh, Joshua and now moving to Judges. Okay? Um, and so we are going to look at the book of Joshua. And I want to open up with a passage of scripture you may or may not be familiar with. And it's in Joshua chapter 5. I'm going to look at verse 13 through 15. And I'm reading out the New King James Version. It says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worship and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Amen. He says, take your sandal off your foot, for the place you stand is on holy ground. The title of today's message is Take Your Shoes Off. Take your shoes off. And, and, and during, at any point during this message, if you feel led or inclined to take your shoes off, you are more than welcome to take your shoes off. Just make sure you got the right uh, socks on, odor blocking, and there's no holes. I'm teasing, but as the Lord leads. But I'm going to invite you all to do that at the end of the service. Go ahead and hand the person next to you if you're comfortable. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do today. I thank you that every single person who has confessed you as their Savior would also confess you as their Lord. For we know that you are not just our Savior, but you are our shepherd, and it is your desire that you would lead us. So, Father, I pray that if any anything in our life or in our heart where we have not fully surrendered or submitted to you, that today would be the day in which we would do that. We give you all the glory and the praise for what you're going to do. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Put your hands together. Let's give the Lord praise. Amen. Praise God. Hey, well, <clears throat> before social media uh, was around, I'd like to s- suggest and believe that most people uh, who never met me but had received my name were surprised when they actually met me or they saw me because they wouldn't associate the name Jonathan Charles Clatt with somebody that looks like this. I look more like a Juan Carlos Clato de Ciblo. But there's a good explanation for all of this. For one, uh, my mother is, uh, uh, more excuse me, I should say my father is Caucasian or he's white, which is which explains my name, but my mother is Filipino, which explains my face. So it's a mixture there, and it kind of, a nice blend, it makes you look like you're from San Antonio. It's a kind of a more Hispanic, Mexican look. Um, And so that's why sometimes when some people will greet me, when I say John, they correct me, and they say Juan. And I'm like, okay, I'll go with Juan Carlos. (laughs) But those, I feel like some people got uncomfortable with that. Uh, but those who, would, who know me would agree that I'm probably more Americana than I am Filipino. But being raised by a Filipino mother and being surrounded uh, for the good part of my youth by a lot of uh, Filipino families, I've come to uh, inherit some deeply ingrained Filipino cultural traits, attributes, quirks, uh, if you will, that other people who would see them might find them amusing or um, not uh, unsettling wouldn't be a good word. Peculiar is probably a better word. Uh, so there are certain things. So maybe if you were like me, born, born and raised really in an American family, there are still some cultural tendencies we do have if you are Filipino. And so for one of those, uh, for Filipinos, you'll notice that I kind of do this too, that whenever we want to point out something, we don't use our fingers because and 
belief is that it's really accusatory and it can be rude, just pointing at things. So we don't use our fingers. What do we use? We use our lips. So if someone says, um, um, where's the food? And you're like, it's over there. And you're like, where, where? Over there. Bro, where's the pastor? Where's Pastor Jonathan? Over there. Dude, where's your money? I ain't got no money. Another thing that we do too is you're trying to get somebody's attention. Usually, you, you know, you say, excuse me or hello, but you say, hi! And you know, you're Filipino, you could be in a store and you hear, hi! And you're going to look, mom? Hi! <laughs> Where's the hippopotamus? Another is uh, that we did for a while until we started having kids is we started washing dishes by our hand, even though we have a, a working dishwasher. And for years, most of us thought that the dishwasher was a drying rack. We had no idea that it actually worked and it cleaned dishes. So it's like you ask your parent when you find out the revelation you got that the dishwasher could probably wash better than you hand washing. You said, why didn't we use the dishwasher? Like, oh, we don't need dishwasher. You are a dishwasher, right? I don't know what accent that is, but you can take it or leave it. The other thing is you find out is that everybody is family. Like I had a friend who's not used to it. He's like, how many siblings and aunts and uncles do you have? Because it's like in the Filipino community, if you, someone's a little bit older than you and they're a male, you call them kuya, which is an older brother. For a female, ate, which is older sister. Now, if they're a little bit older, a lot older than you, then you call them tito, which is uncle, or tita, which is auntie. If they're a lot significantly older than you, then it's Lolo and Lola, which is grand, grandma and grandfather. We even couple that with a show of respect. We call it Manopo, which is when you greet the senior community, you take their right hand and you put their hand to your forehead as to receive a blessing from them and to honor them as well. But you must be careful. You don't want to offend people. <laughs> Try to Manopo them. They're like, yeah, I rebuke that. I am not that old. But everybody is family. But one of the uh, things I want to land on is that when you enter a home, one of the first things you do is you have to take your shoes off or you remove your shoes. It's a common practice to remove your shoes before you enter somebody's home. Now, if you are lost and you're trying to find a house and the person who's hosting is Filipino and you, don't, you forgot the address, you for some reason don't know how to use Waze or GPS, all you got to do is look at a yard that looks like that. You know, be like, oh, okay. Looks like a garage sale of shoes. Thing is, you got to be very careful is because if you have the same shoes as somebody else, you got to make sure you grab the right pair or else you might get a bad case of athlete's foot. One time, that didn't happen to me, but one time, something like it happened. Our basketball team was at this party together and all of us, of course, we had the same basketball shoes. Well, I'm a size 11 and a half. My friend who had the same shoes, he's a size 13. So he left before me. And then when my parents came to pick us up, and this is before I was driving, I went to go get my shoes. And all I could find was an 11 half on my left side and a 13 on my right. And I'm like looking around. I said, man, somebody took my shoes. And then someone said, hey, man, I think it's Oliver. He's the only one that's size 13. So I called Oliver. I said, hey, man, uh, how do your shoes fit? He goes, well, one fits good and the other fits a little tight. I said, dude, that's a size 11 and a half. That is my shoe that you got. And the thing is, we didn't drive, so I couldn't see him for a week. So I had to walk at school with 11 and a half and a 13. So I'm just... <laughs> just make sure you grab the right, the right shoe. But to somebody who sees this uh, and, and implements this in their own house, isn't it true that if someone walks in your house and they do not take off your shoes, you're not happy? Is that true or not true? Some of you don't mind as much anymore because you got wood floors or tile floors. But, you know, when someone walks in and you just kind of stare at them, you're like, huh. Like inside, you're insulted. You're like, you think about all the bacteria they're bringing into the house. And you just stare at them. You look at them up and down. And then they finally get the picture. And then they get the hint. They say, oh, do you want me to take my shoes off? You're like, no, no. It's okay. Whatever. You, you do whatever you want. Mi casa, su casa. Whatever you want to do. But the whole time, you just... 
But for some people who don't understand this, this is kind of confusing. Maybe it could be awkward too, as if you're taking shoes off and you got to, you know, wearing a business suit and you're just in, in your socks, or if you have an outfit that is only complete when you have the shoes on. And it just seems some people just don't understand it. But really, it's more than just hygiene. And part of it is that you don't want to bring the dirt into the living spaces. But it's also a way to honor and respect the host. But not, not everybody understands that or gets that. Therefore, there's articles that are written about, you know, let's move on from being a barefoot, occupied type home. As one comedian said, the only time I take my shoes off is one time at night. That's it. But you know, in the Bible, the Bible gives us examples of shoe removal and, and also being barefoot. And we're going to talk about that here in just a few moments. I told you I was short, so I'm already halfway through my message. You guys don't believe me. I'm going to prove it to you. So we're in, in the book of Joshua. Joshua has ex- succeeded his predecessor, Moses, who has died, and he assumes the responsibility of leading the children of Israel into the promised land, and he's coming up against his first incredible challenge. He has to conquer the city of Jericho. And the people are already motivated. They're filled with excitement and enthusiasm because they miraculously crossed over the Jordan River. Much like when God split the Red Sea for the Israelites uh, coming out of Egyptian captivity, so did God split the Jordan River so they can take over the city of Jericho. So they are ready to begin this military conquest, they're ready to fight. But in preparation for what God had ahead for them, they had to consecrate themselves before the Lord. And that was a tough task. If you think Joshua had his first big victory, which he, he successfully led them across the Jordan River, and now they're all excited about taking over, conquering Jericho. And before they do that, God says in Joshua 5 that he has to implement these, uh, call it rituals or their covenants or their expressions of our covenant. He says, there are some things you have to do first. So everybody's like, you ready to fight? Yeah. All right. What do we do next? Well, everybody who has not been circumcised, you got to get circumcised. Now, if I said that next Sunday is circumcision Sunday, it's probably the lowest attended service. Like, well, we just all females. This is a women's conference or... (laughs) But he had a, there was a whole generation that had not practiced that covenant. The covenant was established with Abraham, and it was a covenant sign that you belong to God. So first they had to be circumcised. Again, they're ready to fight, but they're circumcised first. God gives them a few days to heal. Everybody said, bless you, Lord. <laughs> then they were told to observe this, the Passover, So by partaking the Passover, Israel had to relive the deliverance out of Egypt by the blood of the lamb. And observing that, they're reminded that they were protected and they were covered under the blood when the death angel passed over their house because the blood was on the doorpost. So just like them, it also reminded them of them crossing over into the Red Sea. And the moment they crossed over, it destroyed the Egyptians. Remember when it closed up. Now with the Jordan River looking ahead, the Lord is opening up the Jordan River for them to conquer the Canaanites. So he wants them to remember the past and have an excellent preparation for the future because it's your past victories that will always stir up your present faith that prepares you for future battles. I think I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it twice because it sounds so nice. It is your past victories when you begin to remember it. It stirs up your present faith that prepares you for future battles. So every time they would celebrate Passover, they'll remember what the Lord God has done. And how many of you today are thankful? Just even me saying that, remembering how good God has been and it's stirring up your faith right now, that no matter what is ahead of you, you know that God is for you and God is with you. Can I get a better amen? Amen. The next thing he did is he then cut off the supply of manna. And everybody's like, manna, what is it? Is literally what the name is. But it's like heavenly, uh, what's that? Krispy Kreme donuts. It just melts in your mouth. Like how many would love that, to have it delivered at your doorstep, Krispy Kreme every single day? I mean, God is the one who invented DoorDash, like literally. You just walk outside and there's manna. 
But you know what God did is he cut off that supply. Why would he do such a thing? Because he doesn't want them to be comfortable where they are. He wants them to go and occupy the land that he has for them because the land that that, that he has given to them is already filled with a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And he wants them to eat off the produce of that land. So once they're preparing themselves for this, then we see Joshua The Bible says, came to pass that he went by Jericho. In other words, he went up to Jericho to scout the land, to scout the the walls. Now, again, uh, this is a a battle, and Joshua is out there all by himself. And why would he go out there to scout the land? Well, if you remember, as we went over in the book of Numbers, 40 years prior that there were 12 spies that went out to spy on the land, and the spies came back with this report. Ten of them said, it's a good land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. But there's this problem. The place is strong. The cities are fortified. The people are giants. And we are like grasshoppers. And we cannot do it. But then there were two. Everybody say two. The Joshua's and the Caleb's who says, yes, we can do it. The giants may be big, but our God is bigger. And if God says we can seize the land and take the land, then we're going to believe God at his word. But because majority of the people rebelled against God and they rebelled because they were in fear, God allowed them to stay 40 years in the wilderness. And here's the thing, from Egypt to the land of Canaan should have only taken them 11 days, but it took them 40 years to get in because of unbelief. The Bible says that God prohibited them from entering in the land of rest because they didn't believe him. And so now we have an older Joshua who is ready to lead this next generation of Israelites into the promised land. And again, 40 years have gone by. We have heard accounts where Caleb is uh, at the age of 82, and then we have Joshua here who's at the age of 80. This is like Pastor Leo. Pastor Leo is leading the charge. Pastor Leo, you're 80 years old. Is that right? He won't admit it. Am I, am I exaggerating? 80 in November. Okay, well, happy early birthday. Manopo. He is a Lolo. He is a grandfather. He's 80 years old, at least 80 years old, and he remembers what he saw, that the report was right, that the cities were fortified. There are giants in the land. So he went out there to go and speak scope it out. And if you look at, this is really what Jericho looks like. They said the walls were so thick that you could ride two chariots on each side of it. If you look at the walls of Jericho, this is, tell me if this is not a fortified city. I mean, we don't have security quite like this. So they, they have a, 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 a revetment wall, which is 12 to 15 feet high from its base. Then after that, there's the lower wall, which is 20 to 26 feet from its base. And then you have the upper wall, which is about 46 feet from its base. And this is roughly about a 10-story hotel. But we got three walls. Tell me, is this a fortified city? It's a fortified city. Now, they do not possess the probably the firepower, the technology, or the military ability to be able to seize this land. He's trying to figure out ways in which there are weak spots in the wall, but he's not finding it. That's why he's there all night looking for it because this really is a fortified, impenetrable type wall city. So he's asking himself, how are we going to do this? Have you ever been in that moment before where you're just faced with some insurmountable odds and you're unsure how you're going to overtake this? And you, you, the weight, it feels like the weight of the family and the responsibility or the weight of the world, it feels like it rests solely on you. And here's a moment where he's trying to figure out how is it that God is going to allow us to conquer this city? And it says in the midst of him looking up, he sees a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. So he sees, all of a sudden, he sees this warrior with a drawn sword out of his hand. Now, now you don't have a bent bow unless you're ready to shoot. You don't unholster your gun unless you're about to use it. So imagine, and put in our context, you are looking at Jericho, and there's somebody with a gun out. It's not pointed at you, but it's out, ready to shoot. Now, how many of you, if you didn't have a weapon, or maybe if you had a weapon, How many of you would probably just take off running? But not Joshua, not Pastor Leo. 80 years old, and he's ready to fight him. (laughs) A lesser man would take off running. Now, how many men, be honest, that you're you're not a fighter, you're a lover? 
Like instead, you know, I'm not going to fight you, but I'm going to, I'm going to war. I'm going to go prayer, get my prayer closet. I'm going to go into spiritual warfare. That's how I fight. How many men would be honest? Can we raise your hand? All right. We got one that barely raised that two people. They're like, kind of like me. <laughs> the, the wife's like, yeah, raise your hand higher so he can see you. That's you. There's a story of uh, two men that were hiking and they saw a bear running right at them. And so they started to take off running. And then one of the guys stopped to put on some running shoes. And the other friend says, you think you can outrun a bear? He says, do you think those shoes are going to help you? He goes, no, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> and I can guarantee you, if Joshua was, was with somebody else, that other person would take off running, but not Joshua. Joshua's like Chuck Norris, man. He will slay a bear. He's like David, King David. He will fight a bear if he's got to. So he says this question, he comes up like literally, like the Bible says in the Hebrew language, if you see the guy has his sword drawn out, he says he came up to the man. So he literally went up to him like this. Are you for us or for our enemies? The guy with his, uh, the man with his his sword drawn is either saying he's against Israel or he's with Israel. And so he says, are you with us or are you for our enemies? Because if you're not for us, I'm going to fight you. But if you're with us, you need to bow your knee to me because I am the commander of the Lord's army. There's no neutrality here. You can't be this side and this side. He's wanting to know whose side are you on. And I love what the, the, it says this warrior's response was to Joshua. And Joshua says, are you for us? Are you for our enemies? And the response is, no. I didn't even know no was an option. Didn't ask that question. <laughs> He said, no, because sometimes the answer is no. People give you two, two choices. You really have a third, third choice. Third choice is no. Someone says, what do you want for dinner? Dinaguan or balut? No. <laughs> Kale or cauliflower? No. No. Backstreet Boys or NSYNC? No. All right, really, NSYNC. Any you know, NSYNC? Bye, 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 bye. Okay. <laughs> Joshua, he's like, Joshua, you're asking the wrong question. You're asking whose side am I on? He says, I, I'm not here to take sides. I'm here to take over. And the better question is, is not if I'm on your side. The question is, are you on my side? And when he asked that question, you know what Joshua's response was? The Bible says that he fell down to his face. And why did he fall down? Because this is what is called the theological term Christophany, which is the pre-incarnation of Christ. This is Christ's invisible form. You know, you know what's beautiful about this? Christ, again, is the very representation of our Father. And so the Bible says that when Moses, remember when Moses says he had this, this desire, he says, Lord, show me your glory. Do you remember that? He wanted, he wanted to see all of God in his fullness. But God says the problem is if you saw it all, it would kill you. It's that holy, it's that marvelous and magnificent that even being in my presence would kill you because of how sinful you are. But he made a way. He said he put him in the cleft of a rock, and as he passed by, he saw the glory of the Lord, was able to be in the presence of God. And you know what Jesus Christ is? Is he embodies what our desires is to have a encounter and a pre- to be, be in the presence of God and not be killed. And the way in which he did that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is that rock that allows us to be in the presence of God without, his, without it consuming and killing us. So it's showing that in our greatest need, listen, they're, they're faced against Jericho, and in their greatest need, who shows up? Jesus Christ himself. This is not just an angel. This is the angel of the Lord, the Bible says. My phone keeps going off. I feel like it's the Lord saying, you're right on. Keep going. Amen. It's the angel of the Lord. And you know how you know it's the angel and not an angel? Because in other references in the Bible, whenever man would bow down before an angel and begin to worship the angel, the angel would say, stop doing that. I can't receive that worship. And he would lift them up and he says, I am a created being just like you. All worship must be directed to God. So he's down worshiping and this angel receives the worship because this is Jesus Christ himself. And what Jesus then says next is where we want to land the plane. He says, take off your sandals because the place you're standing on is holy ground. You know what's pretty fascinating about this is that this account 
is just like his predecessor. Remember Moses? When Moses was there with God, hearing the angel of the, of, of the Lord speaking from the burning bush, calling to him, and he says, before you go, take off your sandals for where you stand on his holy ground. And it's not because the, the ground itself was holy because of the elements on it. The, the ground was holy because who was standing there? It was the very presence of God. And when God's presence comes, everything becomes holy in the presence and sight of God. So he says, take off your sandals. And you know, it's a beautiful thing about this is I'm sure Joshua heard this account. And God's promise to him in Joshua 1, he says, so as, as I was with, with Moses, so I'll be with you. And his desire is not just for you to hear about Moses' experience. God wants you to have an encounter with him, with, wants you to have an encounter with him yourself, to have your own encounter with God. And how many of you know that being in God's presence does not compare to anything else in this world? You know, we sing that song, no place I would rather be, no, than here in your love. It's here in your presence, right? You know, the, the, as people who have near-death experiences, you know what, what they say is when they get even a glimpse of eternity, being in God's presence, and then they come back here, there's a sadness about them uh, it, within their heart because they were in the very presence of God, and they said they never want to leave it, never wish they, they like, Pastor Robert Morris of Dallas uh, Gateway had a near-death experience, was in the presence of God, he felt. And he says he was disappointed when he opened his eyes and he saw his wife. Doesn't sound good, <laughs> right? But it's no offense, but there's nothing like being in God's presence. And I think we can testify that in, 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 in a glimpse of it. We get a glimpse of it, not in its fullness, but isn't it true that every time when we come here, when we come together and gather together in God's presence, you're not just here to hear good music, nor to here to hear a good message. You're here to have an encounter with the very presence of God. And being in his presence, the Bible says there's fullness of joy. That being in his presence is what brings times of refreshing. So there's nothing like being in the presence of God. And when he got in the presence of God, God says to him, take off your shoes for the ground you stand on is holy. Now, that doesn't make sense to somebody who doesn't understand what the word holy means. Now, holy does have implications of it being moral, but it's not just about being moral. It's about being separate. So the opposite of holy is not, un, uh, uh, is not immoral. The opposite of holy is common. Holy means set apart. And I've explained it before, and I feel like there's a, quite a few people who were not here. But when my wife makes baked chicken or fried chicken, she always saves the biggest piece for me. You know what that piece is called? It's called holy. Now, when my wife lets anybody touch it, anybody grab it, then it's no longer holy. It's now common because it's no longer set apart for me. That's why in Leviticus, Leviticus, it talks about utensils being used. They're holy and unholy. Unholy means common use. Holy means it's like chinaware. It's special use. It's holy. The Bible, one attribute that describes God is holy. The only time you'll read in Scripture where the same attribute is repeated three times, it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, saying that everything about God is set apart. Nothing about God is common. That's why the Bible, when it speaks of God's holiness, it talks about things that he has are holy. His name is holy. His temple is holy. His spirit is holy. His covenant is holy. His city is holy. His tithe is holy. His ground is holy. His works are holy. His marriage is holy. Even his kisses are holy. Why don't you take a moment, the Bible says that we are to greet one another with a holy kiss. Go ahead and greet somebody with a holy kiss, but make sure it's holy. Okay, not everybody want to do that, but that's okay. Got two guys sitting next to each other. Yeah, good call. We do handshakes or fist bumps here, right? <laughs> holy. Everybody say holy. So what he's saying is you got to take off what is common to be in what is uncommon. He says the sandals that you're wearing is the same sandals you wear for everything. The sandals that you wear for battle is not going to be the sandals you wear to get in my presence. You got to take that off and be bare before me. You know, we all understand the concept. We all have different shoes. There's shoes for working out. Uh, we don't wear workout shoes with our dress clothes. We have shoes for dress clothes, but we don't wear dress clothes for our workout. Uh, dress shoes with our workout shoes is specific for 
the uh, occasion or the event or the attire. So it's the same way. In, in, it's believed that the priests, whenever they would be in the presence of God, they had special shoes, special slippers or sandals that they wear just to be in the presence of God. And so for anything that is common, he's saying to take off because the ground you're standing on is uncommon. It's set apart. And the only acceptable shoe or the only acceptable footwear is for you to go bare. It's a barefoot encounter with it being in the presence of God. Amen. Keeping my word is going to be short. Another, another reason that the removal, and this, this will, will come together, and you see what happens. The removal of a shoe. In the Bible, there are different instances in which somebody was, was to take, over their sh- take off their shoe or off their sandal, and usually it was to um, begin a, some type of covenant agreement. So there, there's an instance in, in the book of Ruth. Uh, if you're familiar with the book of Ruth, uh, it begins with Naomi. Uh, her and her husband moved to Moab. They leave Israel because of a famine. They sell their property. Uh, when they moved, they had, uh, got to Moab. They had two sons, and both of the sons were married. One of them was named was um, uh, Naomi Ruth. The other was Orpah. Not Oprah, but Orpah. Orpah. And you have a wedding. Okay. It's trying to do Oprah, but failed. Sorry, guys. So Naomi, uh, her husband had died, and, uh, and so did her sons. Her sons died. And so she was going to move back to Israel. And Ruth said, I will go where you go. My, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. So Ruth goes with Naomi. And according to the law, the person who could marry Ruth had to be the closest relative, which was Boaz. Now, again, this is southern Israel, so family, it's like deep south. (laughs) Ruth is working the fields. Boaz notices her and says, my, 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 shushy, bye, right? (laughs) And he, 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 he has intentions to marry her. And the custom was that if you wanted to marry somebody, you had to go before the elders of the city to tell them your intention of marrying. He says, she is my close relative. And they said, okay, well, if you do that, what you have to do is going to cost you something. They sold their property uh, in Israel. And in order for you to marry her, you have to redeem the property, meaning you have to buy it back. So it's going to cost you. And the Bible says that Boaz was like, oh, no, that's too much. Never mind. No, I didn't say that. He, he was willing to make. Some people make that, that decision, though. I want to tell all the men who are single here, EJ, when you, the moment you decide you want to get married, it's going to cost you something. All the women said, amen. And then your next question is, well, how much? Everything you got. All the women said, and for women, same is true with you. When you get married and when you are married, it costs you everything you got. Amen. That's the only way marriage works. So he had said to her that he was willing to buy back the land. So Ruth chapter 4, verse 7 through 8 says, now this is how, this is how he finalized the deal, to redeem back the property. So whoever owns it has to sell it back to him, and this is the way he does it. Okay? Now this was a custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, so he took off his sandal. So this was like the, yes, deal, I agree. I am giving up the rights to this property. You can buy it. You can have it. Okay? Now, there's another custom, and uh, so if this, if, this, if this were true still today, how many of you here of the men have a sister-in-law? You have sister, a sister-in-law. Okay. All right. So if you have a sister-in-law and say your brother passes away and they didn't have a son, and they couldn't carry on the lineage, then you were obligated to marry your sister-in-law. And so they even have, have conditions in place. If you marry her and then you die, then your next brother 
has to marry your sister-in-law as now your ex-wife. And if he dies, then the next brother has to. And my question is, man, after two, I'm like, something's wrong with her. Like, for sh- something's up. You need to investigate that. <laughs> I was like, they have a contingency plan after three deaths? Man, you keep going. But if there was a situation where a brother-in-law looks at his sister-in-law and is like, mm, me no likey. Like, he's like, no, thank you. I will pass. Well, you can do that, and here's how you pass. In Deuteronomy 25, verse 7. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel, He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face and answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandals removed. Well, the plus side is she gets to spit in his face. You are now the house of him who had his sandal removed. So this guy had to get his name changed. So he had to go to the DMV. He gets passport changed. His name was Ed, but now it's the man whom, <laughs> the house of whom had the sandal removed. Imagine applying for, yeah, man, anyways, <laughs> applying for a mortgage. Like Your name, oh. The house of him who had a set. Uh, sister-in-law problems. Yeah. I feel. He's like, my name is named too. Like, I am the man, the man whose house. Or anyways. All right, let me, let me close. All right, I'm closing now. So what does this all mean? It, it simply means you're giving up your right. The rights you have, you give it up. So in God's presence, when he says, remove your sandals, What you're saying is, I will give up the right. Remember how he introduced himself. I am, he says, but is now as the commander of the army of God. Wait a second, that's Joshua's title. But Jesus takes the title. And if Joshua accepts it, he removes the right and gives the right to Jesus and let Jesus lead. So symbolically, when you take off your sandals, You're saying, I give up the right to lead my own life, and I surrender to you fully and completely. And you have to when you hear, because notice that the moment that he surrenders, he surrenders all all the plans he probably had come up with himself. He lays before the Lord, and he says, speak, your servant is listening. What do you have me to do? So God gives him the plan. Again, Jericho is a fortified city, impenetrable walls. Here's the plan he gives him. He says, for six days, I want you guys just to put on some new balance shoes, and I want you just to walk around the property. Do not say a word. Do not speak. Do not do anything other than just walk. Do that for six days. But on the seventh day, you're going to walk around six times. But on the seventh time, you are going to blow the trumpets, bring the Ark of the Covenant in the front, and every man who has lungs in his breath will shout unto God with a voice of triumph, shout unto God with a voice of victory. And you know what? Imagine that plan is given to you. Whatever plan doesn't make sense. Like, how in the, what? By shouting? What? This walking? When do we use weapons? You're not. Put them away. You're just going to put on some shoes, New Balance shoes. That doesn't make any sense at all. This is not what I would plan. But the Bible says that on that seventh day, on the seventh time, when they shouted, the walls came crashing down. But here's the thing. L- listen, like, have you, ever heard, have you ever been in a room when there's, like, such a mighty roar that you feel like the walls are shaking? You ever been in a room like that? Can we try it? No, I'm just kidding. We don't. Some of you are like, no, nah, I got a mask, and I meant, you know. But listen, <clears throat> when you see the Bible says the walls didn't come crumbling down, it says the walls fell flat. It's as if, and, and Brother uh, Rob, if you could put that picture back up, You see all these walls right here? It's as if, and see, even archaeological digs have found that the rocks didn't crumble. What they found was the the walls just tipped over. It's as if somebody's finger 
just pressed against the wall and pushed it down. And who did that? The commander of God's army. Jesus Christ did himself. Now, in order for him to get to that plan, he had to take his shoes off. Give up the right to lead your life. You surrender completely. And how many know God's way is better than your ways? His plans for you are better than your plans. His thoughts he has for you are better than the thoughts that you have for yourself. You can't even imagine how good God's plans are for you. And the reason why many of us do not conquer Jericho's or enter in the promised land is because we have not yet taken off our shoes. Like, I, I, I recognize you as Savior. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. But I have not crossed over yet to take off my sandals to declare you as my Lord. And his desire is not just to be Savior, but also your shepherd. And the Bible says he's a good shepherd. Emphasis, good. The problem is, is people believe in a God they do not, they do not trust. That's why you don't take off your sandals. In uh, John 13, this is when Jesus, right before he was the Last Supper, you guys remember what he did? He washed his disciples' feet. And did you guys know that when you, have, when, you, when you wash somebody's feet, what do they have to do first? They have to take their shoes off. You know who was upset by this? Peter. Now, everybody's looking at my socks now. <laughs> this one's about to bust through y'all right there. This is what Peter said. He says, no, I forbid it. You cannot wash my feet because he's right. The rabbis would never, ever wash the feet of their students or the master would wash the feet of their servants. And Jesus says, you're right. You're absolutely right. He said, but will you relinquish your right to be right? And let me wash your feet. Because if I do not wash you, you can have no part in me. Notice he didn't say wash your feet. He says wash you. Just by washing your feet, coming in contact with your feet, will cleanse all of you. He says, are you okay about not being right? You know, I think at some point, this, this, is, this has been my, bur- this was my burden for the day. And as I was driving up here, I thought about a lot of things, and I felt like God asked me, <clears throat> why did you put your shoes back on? I just felt like he was telling me, take them back off. And you think about your life. You know, G- G- Jesus was, he, he accomplished more than anybody that ever walked this planet could ever accomplish. But you ever notice he was never burnt out, stressed out? He was never like, oh, I have anxiety or I'm in depression. And, and the reason why is because he did exactly what God t- told him to do, even to the point where God led him to the cross. But he willingly went there. He asked if there's any other way, let this cup of suffering pass from me. But he says, not my will. Let your will be done. You know what he did in the garden? He took off his sandals, gave up his right. When he left heaven, you know what he did? He gave up his sandals. He went from a son to becoming a slave, becoming sin himself. And when I think about this, I was just, one one day I was just, you know, you could get overwhelmed with things. And I had this thought this morning. It's like, and and it's, it's to you too. You might have taken your sandals off at once, but why did you put it, put it back on? And God's asking you to take your sandals off again. You know, um, there's a lot of things that happen throughout. Like the you, what reasons that we would do that is, remember when, when you were so messed up and then someone asked to come in, you know, Jesus come in your heart and you're like, man, I am such a, I am messed up royally and badly, and you're so receptive to it. You willingly take off your shoes, but after a while, you become mature. After a while, you're discipled, and after a while, you start thinking to yourself, you know what, God, why don't you go ahead and lead somebody else who really needs it? I think, I, I think I'm at a point where I can lead some things myself. So you start putting your shoes back on. And you know what God will do? He'll remind you of where you came from. Oh, man, I'm breaking my word. Two points, and I'm done. Here we go. There's this pastor who would preach barefoot every Sunday. Nobody ever understood why. He would dress in a nice suit, very well off. 
Um, but he would take off his, his shoes right before he would come up on the platform. And when he would preach, he'd preach the whole sermon with no shoes on, barefoot. Then one of his social pastors finally had the courage to ask him about the strange practice. He says, why do you take your shoes off? He goes, oh, it's quite simple. Simple. He says, I do it to humble myself. He says, well, you don't realize my dad was a janitor. And for many years, I didn't have shoes. We were that poor. And that whenever I would come to help my dad clean, sometimes I would do it barefoot. So whenever I take my shoes off, because the Lord has increased my platform, allowed me to resource churches, and I've done very well. But what the Lord reminds me of is where I came from. Those moments when I was barefoot humble before the Lord, realizing I didn't get through Jericho because of my own strength. I did it because of the help of my God. And you know, for me, the Lord often does this to me where I remember I was on a Wednesday night prayer and one of our members was just dancing around the sanctuary. And we were just in in, in worship and I was like watching her. And I said, oh, man, I remember when I used to do that, when I would just dance around the sanctuary in worship, when I didn't care what anybody thought. And I remember I just had that thought, and I just felt like God asked me, he said, would you dance for me again? And I tell you what, it was hard. And I realized it's been a while since I danced before the Lord. And on that Wednesday night, something broke And we, as a church, there's about 60 of us here, we're running and jumping and dancing around and just worshiping God, praising God in his presence. And and a few few months back, I remember I would do this from occasion. I would just, right before I would come up on the platform, I I would kneel before the Lord, just humble myself, And I would say to the Lord, thank you for the privilege to be able to serve you in the capacities we get to. It's a joy and a privilege to share your word. And um, I I saw a pastor, um, like two pastors. One pastor was just right before he preached. He was literally on his knees and worshiping God, rocking back and forth. Her story of another pastor, Indians or crisscross applesauce is the correct word, sitting on the floor worshiping God. And I remember watching, and I felt like God asked me, he said, would you kneel before me again? So I started making my custom. Before I preach, I'd get on my knees, and i just worship the Lord. So as I was driving today, I felt like God asked me, would you take your shoes off again and let me lead your life? And I think some people here, you've done very well for yourself. Things have been going well. You don't have any issues. Financially, you're doing great. Maybe you have the marriage you want, the relationships you want. But at some point, you have once had your shoes off. Now you put it back on. And I think the Lord is asking you right now, if you truly want to surrender your life as a physical demonstration, is that today you would take your shoes off, stand on holy ground, and begin just to worship him. And this is what you say, Lord. I surrender my life. I surrender my right to lead my own life. I give it to you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask you to do that. I didn't ask first service too, but second service feels right. If you're here today, and I want you to worry about what shoes or socks that you're wearing or what your feet might smell like. But if you're here today and you would say, I'm just being in God's presence, then I just want to recommit my heart to him. And I just want to, I'll take off my shoes as a sign to show, Lord, I, Jesus, I give my life fully to you. I surrender it all completely to you. And if that's you, I want you just where you are. Just take your shoe off. It doesn't have to be both. It could be just one shoe. I know some people have a hard time reaching that low. But if you're able to, take your shoe off. And what I want you to do right now is we're going to do what Joshua did. Is He was just before the Lord, face down, with his shoes off. He had a barefoot encounter with God. And he says, Lord, your servant is here. I'm listening. 
And so our worship team is going to sing a song. And I want you to ask the Lord to speak to you. And I want you to tell the Lord to, re, re, to confirm or reconfirm your own desire that he would lead your life. Not just be Savior, but also be Lord of it. Go ahead and let the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I pray that you minister right now to every single person. In Jesus' name. Do whatever you want to.